This message is brought to you by DoNotAge.org, the longevity research organisation that's on a mission to extend health span for as many people as possible via products that actually work. Start your journey today at DoNotAge.org and use code LAMA for a 10% discount. That's L-L-A-M-A. Biologically, even today, if you're 50, because of the bad, unhealthy lifestyle we had, you're 55, so you're, you're going to get diabetes five years earlier or cancer or, or whatever first chronic condition you're going to have. You've been stripped of five years of your life. Hello and welcome to the Live Long and Master Aging podcast. I'm Peter Bowes. This is where we explore the science and stories behind human longevity. Now, longevity science is moving at quite a pace these days, and one of the most exciting aspects of following this sphere of research is seeing science put into practice and the knowledge gleaned from sometimes decades of research applied to people, you and I, in a very practical sense. Well, today I've come to the headquarters of El Nutra, a self-described nutrition technology company, probably best known for the fasting mimicking diet developed by Dr. Walter Longo, whom we've spoken to a couple of times on past episodes of this podcast. With me is Dr. Joseph Anton, who runs the show here. He's the CEO, a physician by training and a vocal advocate for the science that helps people live better for longer. Dr. Anton, welcome to the Live Long and Master Aging podcast. Thank you very much. Look forward for a great talk today. Yeah, it's really good to see you. What is it about aging and aging science that clearly so fascinates you? Well, um, you know, I was I was trained as a doctor, and um, and as a physician, we we typically see patients after they get a symptom, and they develop a disease. And but what I think we miss big time in medicine is, you know, the four biggest killers of humanity today, whether it's cancer, diabetes, cardiovascular, or Alzheimer's, they're the expression of aging. Actually, we thought each one has a complete different so, you know source, pathway, reason, etc. And then one day I was talking with an aging expert and he told me, how come medicine still treats these diseases separately? And I was like, what do you mean? They're, they're completely separate. They, Alzheimer's is in the brain and the heart attack is in the heart. He was like, yeah, they, they manifest differently, but you don't get the first heart attack at age 20 and you don't get Alzheimer's at age 22, even though if you have the APOE gene or you have predisposition, um, they still happen at later stage in life. And actually practicing medicine or practicing Healthcare should be based on aging. Um, you know, in most cases, you're not going to have cancer at age 20. In some cases, it happens, and we can talk about that. You're not going to have, in most cases, your diabetes type 2 at age 17. You're going to have most of these diseases at age 40 and 50 and 60 and 70 and 80. So it's all about aging, and it's not just a clock ticking. It's now the biological aging, which is becoming very important. In, in old days, our ancestors were leading a healthy life, so if they were 40 chronologically, probably biologically, they were also 40 or, or even healthier. In today's lifestyle, we're eating so bad, we're stressing a lot, we're not sleeping well, and we're not receiving and giving love the way and happiness the way we were doing before. So a lot of us, and we're obese and overweight, so a lot of us are actually biologically older. And when you're older, it means you're getting closer, faster to, the, to, to one of the diseases we talked about. And this is what really medicine should be about. I think biological aging should be the unit of measurement in healthcare. If and and we see this in cars, right? We did the same thing with car. When you want to buy a car, what's the worth of the car? Is the year was uh, built, right? This is your chronological age. And then you ask about the mileage, how much it was used. That's your biological age. So you really are talking about what I hear often these days, and, and that is using this expression aging as the disease that we're talking about that is all encompassing and possibly having some sort of on a, a scale of one to ten where you come in terms of how you, well you are aging. Yeah. So aging is it itself is not a disease, it's a physiological process, but it's the biggest determinant of your exposure to diseases, right? So it's the biggest risk factor if you want for diseases. We focus a lot on genetics, we focused a lot on uh, on you know lifestyle, which are really important, but aging remains the most important factor for many diseases. 
most importantly, the many of the chronic diseases that were that are killing 87% of us today. We mentioned Alzheimer's, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and cancer. So we should pay tremendous attention to aging, not just chronologically, but biologically, meaning how well is our body from the inside? Just to help people understand what is biological aging. It's really how well are we from the inside? When you buy a car, if it was produced six months ago, but you overused every day, it's already an old car. And that's exactly what biological aging is. Now you can buy a car 10 years ago, put it in a garage, go to Europe and come back after 10 years. It's still a new car and it's not going to broke down the next day you're going to drive it. That's exactly what we should be looking at in medicine and in healthcare today. Well, I want to delve into that in much more depth. Just before we do, though, you, as I mentioned, you trained as a a physician. That was at least the beginning of your career. But you've gone in different directions, haven't you? You've been involved in the business side of of health, the policy side of health as well. Can you just give me a little potted history of how you got to this point? Yeah. So um, I was trained as a physician, and uh, when I was doing my rotations, and I wanted to be a cardiologist, and I was very passionate about it. And, um, but then looking at, you know, sitting on the sides of doctors when I was still a trainee, it was fascinating to me the way we were practicing medicine. First, I felt we're always seeing people after they develop something. It's like today, let's fix our cars after they're burning on the highway. We don't do this. We have checkup systems. We have insurances for everyone. We have mechanics and prevention and computers, right? And number two, even when that person had a symptom, it, the solution was a pill. It was like, oh, you need to diagnose it. And then the best thing I felt I can do is to give them one pill for the blood pressure, one pill for the uh, the blood sugar, one pill for uh, if they have any, any other metabolic, you know, say for triglyceride, one pill for cholesterol. And if you look at that, most people who are actually having a little bit of a high blood pressure, they're having a little bit of higher cholesterol, they're having a little bit of higher t- cholesterol and triglyceride, is because they're a little bit older, they're not able to, their metabolism slowed a little bit down, and they're having stress in their life, and they're developing what we call a metabolic syndrome, meaning they you know, have this typical belly that we see today, and, um, and this is what is pushing the blood pressure, this is what's pushing everything. So the solution would have been first to tell them to improve their lifestyle and they need to lose the weight they need to kind of find a better sense of purpose better happiness environment for them and the weight will go off and their metabolic and their aging would be better and then you see these numbers improving what we're doing today we're giving them a pill for x a pill for y and a pill for z and the pills just help with the numbers it decreases cholesterol but doesn't mean it solved the disease so as a physician was that a frustration for you that was huge for me because i was i felt i didn't sign up to, to be just trained to mitigate symptoms after they happen. I was too passionate about people's life. And, and I, so I decided not to specialize. I decided to go directly into health policy and public health. So I did my, um, my health policy studies at Harvard. Then I did uh, public health at Hopkins. And at the same time, I was like, if we need to change medicine, you need to go back to innovation. The innovation is what brings the pill to the market or the surgery or so I decided to go and learn how we innovate, how we bring solutions. And this is why I decided to join Lilly, one of uh, the pharma companies, and learn the biotech business, learn how to launch products, how to discover them, how to price them, learn about how governments around the world are thinking about this concept of bringing new technology by bringing it to keep people healthy rather than keeping them sick long. And, um, and that was a great journey for me. And, um, and um, when I was at Lilly, I started also... Uh, uh, or right after, start getting involved into system reforms and start teaching at the University of Chicago health system reform as well. It was a big passion of mine, and I founded the Journal of Health Systems and Reform. But I was searching for a solution because we all know today, and I talked to many ministers of health around the world, you ask them why you're not investing more in prevention. We know that this is the best way to go, and they know that. But prevention was more about recommendations. It wasn't a market, it wasn't a product, it wasn't a tangible thing. We all know we, need to, we, need to, we don't need to smoke, yet some of us, they're stressed, they, they, they want to smoke. We all know that you should not overconsume alcohol, but we get addicted to it to, to also from a lifestyle perspective and etc. So I was looking for how we can bring the concept that we did in sick care of having technology leading to a pill, leading to reimbursement and government recognizing it, how can we create a preventive market, a product-based market? And then I had that meeting with the gentleman in aging who told me aging should be that market. And then 
I started traveling across the U.S. talking to aging experts, and most of them were pointing at Walter Longo, who's the head of the Longevity Institute at USC, because he was uh, one of the you know leading aging researchers. But not only that, he discovered fasting that could really help with uh, with healthy aging. On top of that, was able to mimic it with the technology called the fasting mimicking diet. I'm pretty sure we're going to talk about it. But that, for me, represented that if we have a product that can go for healthy aging, and when you have a product, you have a market, people start consuming, people start investing, government recognizes it, and we can then officialize this concept of aging. And this is how I completed the full circle and decided to join him and help him launch this concept globally. So that's what gets you to El Nutra right yeah. now and yeah. your relationship with Walter. And uh, you mentioned his work, and uh, I mentioned at the start that we have covered in, in quite some considerable detail the progress of the fasting mimicking diet. And indeed, I was part of uh, one of the clinical trials uh, yeah. a good few years ago, right at the very beginning, one of the first 19 to try this diet and, and subsequently have continued with the diet over the years. So tell me, what inspired you about Volta? Because he is, as you say, he is a, yes. a beacon in so yeah. many respects, isn't he? His, oh, let's just say his enthusiasm, but his passion, yes. but his, the seriousness with which he takes yes. this subject. That's a, that's a great question because in my previous life working with biotech and doing consulting, I was CEO of a consulting company, I interacted with a lot of researchers in, 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 on the pill side. So in 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 a little bit the character, the science, the meticulousness, which Walter had that top notch level, but Walter was way more than that. Walter to me was bringing evidence based medicine to nutrition. You know, we all know that nutrition is so important for our lifestyle and longevity. At the same time, and there are companies making billions of dollars in nutrition. At the same time, ninety nine point nine percent of everyone I talk to or I ask. They cannot name one article, one super, you know, uh, 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 um, credible article in nutrition that is at the level of pharma and biotech to support claims that that they're that that all these companies are making. So, in a sense, you have very high regulations after the, the drug industry, and the drug industry proved credibility because of the science they put there. And a little bit the nutritional field was a little bit relaxed, and therefore a lot of companies were able to. Uh, uh, you know, put products in the market that, you know, obviously help, but we never knew how much. So Walter decided to do the opposite. Walter decided to start in a lab doing, you know, a bench work, scientific work behind fasting and fasting mimicking that went into preclinical trials like we do in biotech. So did the mice trials, what we call preclinical, and then was going to human trials. The same way, actually, you look at developing a drug. And that level of credibility and honesty and, and genuity is, is for me what the nutrition market really needed. Every day you hear a new idea about what you should eat, what you should not eat, and one day it's more protein, one day it's less protein, one day it's antioxidant, how to live better. And they, so one day it's they, fat, they, the next day it isn't fat, yeah, saturated so, fat, all those issues. Yeah. yeah. So what struck me first, as I said, is the high scientific credibility. What struck me second was he wanted to do this right. And third, which was very impressive to me, typically, you know, scientists and researchers are, live in their environment. They, they, and they're very interested about the science, but they're a little bit sometimes also live that word. Walter told me one thing that really changed or, or inspired me to, to move it with him. He said, and I want to change the entire world. I want to really change medicine. And I really, I think I have discovered something that's so powerful that's going to help longevity and help people live healthier longer and so that was the dream the ambition was exactly the call that i wanted coming from health policy coming from changing the world changing healthcare systems it was a great marriage to hear the inventor talking about how significant this could be to humanity the fourth point which which blew me away then in that this first discussion we had he said and i'm donating all of it back i don't want to make a penny i don't want to bias anything i discover i just want to be uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm living very well on my tenure track at the University of Southern California, and I don't need to make any money of this. Actually, I want to donate it, and that donation should go to additional research, should go to the poor who cannot access what we're discovering and, and, and access medicine. So for me to see a, a, a medicine like biotech, the inventor who's decided to do things the right way, 
uh, wanting to change the world with a big plan and wanted to donate all of it back for a second change of the world uh, was so compelling for me. And I left everything and came and joined him. Well, that's an important point that you make, because often a criticism of, of scientists that are, are involved in this field is that they are ultimately going to make money yes. out of a product linked to the science that they've been carrying mm-hmm. out. And I, I've talked to Walter about this as well. And he's created the Create Cures Foundation, Foundation yes. which is where the money goes, which yes. is in itself is is blossoming now yes. to do uh, other and related work. Yes. So indeed, um, he founded the Create Cures Foundation, and um, and Walter still has, uh, you know, he's he founded Alnutra. Um, so just to, to kind of inform here the listeners, so as a, he's the leader of the Longevity Institute at the University of Southern California, and once he discovered the value of fasting and fasting mimicking diet, um, and how to bring this to people's hand, he founded Alnutra, and L stands for longevity. It's longevity through nutrition. This is what Alnutra means. And he founded that company. Obviously, as a founder, you would be uh, uh, the major shareholder. And with time, you know, you bring more capital to it and, and you get diluted. But everything he owns in a company, uh, he donates to the Create Curse Foundation, which then puts it in more research or puts it in helping people. Um, we've, uh, they've done a lot of good projects already in the U.S. and projects in, in Europe trying to help poor people or people with certain conditions uh, you know, improve their lifestyle, and improve their outcomes. And I think they're soon, they're going to launch a new clinic in Los Angeles. That's so uh, um, uh, interesting. So they're going to be one of the first longevity clinics in LA. And this is all being funded by, again, the work he's done and Alnutra's work that's donating for them. Well, if you'd like to hear from Volta directly, episodes 1 and 46, uh, you go to the website, you can look in the back catalogue and, and listen to those interviews and you can hear Volta in his own words tell his story and the science behind the diet he talks about. I'm going to Ecuador, in fact we went together to yeah. Ecuador a few years ago to see a group of people with Laurent syndrome. It it gets pretty detailed but it's it's a fascinating insight to the, the depth of the science that's gone into the development of this diet. At the heart of which is the fasting mimicking diet or prolon as it's known and uh, it's continued to evolve and and change slightly over the years give me a a a roundup maybe of where we are with that diet from from where i started with it in the little little white boxes like one two three four five (laughs) well a lot has happened in the last three to four years um so you know, Walter, and, and we, we talk a lot today, today about intermittent fasting or skipping food for a few hours, right? And that's, that's important to maintain your weight balance and, and, and your metabolism. But the biggest discovery that Walter led at the University of Southern California was the value of a prolonged fast. Meaning what happens to the body if you go beyond one day? You go two days, three days, four days, five days. What happens to the body? And actually the body does the same thing that a company going bankrupt would do. If you have a company, you don't, there's no good, or you have zero finances, let's say, coming back, you need a million dollars to operate. Tomorrow, somebody comes in and tells you, hey, I'm going to give you zero. So you're going to go to the bank, use your savings. This is how you lose weight in a body perspective. You start going to your reserves and fat are the reserves. But it gets interesting when time goes by, you're consuming your reserves, and now say you're the CEO of this company. You have no money. You're going to start restructuring the company. You're going to start improving operations because you want to be more effective and efficient in the way you deal with money. You're going to shut down some ineffective projects. You're going to empower people who are the you know the best in the company and all of that. And this is what the body starts doing after day two or three. Is the body starts going to the cells, telling the cell, "Hey, I cannot feed you anymore any longer. I'm giving you some ketones from the fat reserves, but you got to do a better job." And the cells start going through this process called autophagy. They start uh, renewing their inside and correcting their performance and their options. And in mice, we even saw on on, on a prolonged level, the body now is asking the younger cells to blossom at the expense potentially of the older cells. This is what the initial preclinical, the mice trials have shown. So so the value of a prolonged fast over a short fast, intermittent fasting is good for the weight and the balance, and the longer fast is actually adding an extra level of uh, renewal and rejuvenation to the body. And that was fascinating to him. And, um, but it's so difficult to fast for two and three and four and five days. So in order to help people complete that fast in a safe and effective way, he developed the fasting mimicking diet. 
Uh, you asked me about what attracted me to him. Most of the funds coming to sponsor his work were coming from the National Institute of Health. And for people who are not very familiar with the National Institute of Health, that's one of the most credible funder in, in the U.S. Of, of cutting edge science. And that adds validity to what he was doing because you have big committees there reviewing the science and approving the, uh, the grants and all of that. So the NIH kind of helped him uh, fund the project of discovering you know, the value of fasting for prolonged fast, but also developing the fasting mimicking diet to help people not only go through the fast, but also go through it in a safe and effective way. And so what is the fasting mimicking diet? It's really food that you can eat it comes in the form of bars and soups, and it's, it's very consumer-friendly the way like you eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner. But at the same time, the ingredients are studied to nourish you while not triggering the sensors at the cell. So the cell does not recognize that it's being fed, although it's being fed. Let me go back to the example. You have a company, say you need a million dollars a month to operate. If I come in and give you $200,000, right? It's not like, you, oh, you're going to say, thank you, I'm off the stress, I don't need to fix my company, I don't need to restructure, I don't need to go and spend in, in my savings. You're going to do all of it. You're going to have less pressure because you have some money. And actually that $200,000, you're going to deploy it in functions that are essential and you're going to deploy it also to restructure the company. So in some cases in mice, we even saw that the fasting mimicking diet is doing on some items better than the water fast because the body is even able to finance its change and it and it's, uh, doesn't have to be a drastic, severe, uh, you know, zero, uh, zero food, uh, uh, pure fast. So the goal of the fasting mimicking diet was to help people eat something while they're fasting. It was to nourish the body, the vital organ while you're fasting, while keeping at the cellular level uh, the signal of fasting to the cells so that they keep restructuring and helping and, and, and renewing. So once you discover that, uh, there were two avenues of using the fasting mimicking diet. One is for longevity. Obviously, if you lose weight, if you, uh, if you, have, if you uh, reset your metabolism, and if you're renewing your cells, this is all going for healthy aging. And actually, the fasting mimicking diet was awarded uh, a patent on promoting longevity and health span, mainly because of the initial data on, in, in mice on, on, the, on the renewal, the cellular renewal, and, and everything we talked about. Um, but also you start seeing applications saying, well, if the body already has a disease, how, how, let's see how the body deals with that disease if, you, if you're fasting. Going back to the company example, if you know suddenly you, know, you need a million dollars, I don't give it to you, and then you know that maybe Susie or Brian, the leading a department that's sunking the company down, shouldn't we go and start talking to Susie and Brian to fix their department. So if the body already has a disease, would the body try under fasting, go and resolve or work with that disease or improve it or, or employ the cellular renewal in that disease? So he started testing initially in mice, and now we have um, over 20 human trials, clinical trials ongoing on different conditions, health conditions. But initially in mice, we started looking at if, you have, if the mice has cancer, what should we do, what, what the fasting mimicking diet does, if we have diabetes, etc. And so, so kind of the vision of the fasting mimicking diet is a part for longevity for healthy people and a part being tested today in a lot in mice and some in humans as well on applications for certain conditions. And of course, probably still the most high profile immediate effect of the diet is going to be weight loss, which is, I think, what attracts the vast majority of people yeah. to any diet. And we'll continue this conversation in just a moment. Hey, quick question for you. Are you someone who wants to be fit, healthy, and happy? And what if I told you you could get your dream body by simply just listening to a podcast? I'm Josh. And I'm KG, and we are the hosts of the Fit, Healthy, and Happy podcast. Listen, we get it. Fitness isn't easy. Carbs, no carbs. Just stop, okay? It doesn't have to be that complicated. And that's why we made this podcast. We get straight to the facts so you can become your best you. So the way to check us out is click the link in the show notes or search Fit, Healthy, and Happy podcast on any of the major podcast platforms. We'll see you soon. Yeah, the word diet there for us is if people, when they hear fasting mimicking diet, they hear weight, which is definitely the short-term ticket. A lot of people come and consume uh, the first product that we launched, we called it Prolon uh, for promoting longevity. And, and Prolon is, um, is the five days fasting mimicking diet. So I always say there's a short-term ticket, you lose the weight super fast. I mean, uh, you know, 73% of Americans are overweight or obese today, and, and we all struggle losing the weight fast. But you can imagine that with fasting, 
if the signal of fasting is to the body. This is one of the fastest way you can lose weight. So a lot of people come for the short-term ticket, you know, after five days, and, and they love the prolon because it's only five days diet, you know. We all struggle also being on a diet for very, very long term, and this is why a lot of diets fail. It's just you have to be on it every day. It's intrusive uh, to your lifestyle rather than it's, it's, it can integrate with it. So prolon integrates easy with it. You have to plan five days to be on the diet. But losing weight isn't at the top of your list of, of goals. Yes, this so is a longevity this, diet. Yeah, and that's and the clearly, short term. if you do it once, yes, yeah. you're going to lose a few pounds. Yeah. But then if you don't do it again, you can, yeah. most people will probably yes. put those pounds back on again. Exactly. So it's the short term ticket. You lose the weight very fast. You lose it in a healthy way because actually what we've shown, it protects your lean body mass relatively as well. And, but the, the high ticket, the longevity ticket is you're doing it, you're resetting your metabolism, but also you're asking your cells to take care of themselves. It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's like an intracellular uh, 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 cleanup or, or cleansing or renewal or you, you name it, but that level helps you uh, uh, with healthy aging, which no other diet has been able to uh, to think this way or address it this way. Now you talked about the weight. Obviously, you do five days. You lose. You know, people lose in, in multiple pounds depending on their on their initial BMI. And if you go back, you don't change your lifestyle. After a while, if you're back to your burgers and pizza, obviously you put it back. But then this is when you come back and you and and you correct it fast uh, with with another cycle if need be. So let me ask you this. In the years that you have been producing the the diet, the fasting mimicking diet, and commercially, and now people around the world have have tried it and repeatedly used it yes. over a, maybe a three month cycle or a six month cycle, whatever is appropriate for the individual. What have you learned in the last, say, five years about the diet that you didn't know and, and Walter wouldn't yes. know at the beginning? Because clearly you will have a, a yes. vast amount of data, the feedback that you're getting from people. Yes. And I ask that question based on my own experiences yes. of having done it right from the very beginning. Yes. And I, I might sound like sort of a super fan of, of this diet, which and I certainly am positive about it. The, the one negative from my perspective was the boredom factor with yes. the food, the, the yes. repetition yes. that was involved that you had to do every three or four months which doesn't yes. sound like a lot yeah. but then I got to the point that I felt well oh, it's another one of those soups or yes. it's another one of those bars yes. and I was de-incentivized to some extent now I haven't yes. actually tasted the, the latest yeah. batch of foods that you yeah. have but I'm, I'm just curious what you've learned from people yeah we actually learned a lot you know when before launching the product the focus was on mimicking fasting right that was the focus and the company is not a, a company in, in, in nutrition and dieting to start with. Um, so the concept was science, focus on the science, bring the most credible you know, nutrition product. Once we went to the market, we learned a lot. And a lot of things that we took in to improve and a lot of things that were positive, which we have never thought about. So one of the first things we took in to improve was that, like you're saying, we had one prolon version. So even though you know most people do it once every two or three or four months, uh, um, or even you can do it two or three times a year only, still you know being on the same meal plan, you get bored. You know, for we call it taste fatigue. So this is why last year we launched another version of uh, of um, uh, new soups. We introduced new new options, and we're and a third one about to go out. Uh, soon as well. So mm. giving people some varieties. I think if you do it three to four times a year and you have three versions, this is this is how life is. Actually, you eat more frequently the same food throughout the year than, than three times. But we, what we also learned, it was a great learning for us, is that what Prolon, you know, most people, they develop what we call learned helplessness with dieting. Meaning I tried a diet I started week one, week two, week three, and then I lose, you know. It just people feel that they're learn to be helpless versus diet. There are a few people that can tell you, I win, I did this diet and I did it for a long time, and I feel you see these big shows on TV, you see, and then you read the, the data, they're going back to where they were, they go back into their little bit depression and all of that. I think what we've learned with Prolon, which wasn't by design, but is definitely helping, it's a five day. There's a day one, there's a day five. And once you're done, you're done. And for a lot of people, they say, finally, I finished a diet. And in fact, because it mimics fasting, fasting is such a big transformation on the body, they feel a change. It's not that they need to wait for weeks and weeks and weeks. They lose the weight fast. They feel the, the energy and, and all the emotional actually attributes to the product, which we haven't tested in the clinical trial. We were too scientific in the trial. Now people talk about the better sleep, the better energy, the sense of empowerment. 
So all this emotional aspect of it is something we hadn't studied, we discovered in the market. What do people tell you about when they feel at their best in, in terms of the emotional yes. response to the diet? Yes. Is it during the diet? I know there's yeah. that sort of middle of the diet or yeah. towards the end yeah. mental high that you feel, perhaps when you're going into ketosis, which is quite well documented, yes. but also the, the, the days after as well. Is yes. there a, a consensus from yes. the people that you've talked to in terms of when you feel really good based on this yeah. diet? So the journey is varies depending on the individual, but but the core of it is the first two days. You know, you feel that your body is you know is going after the fat. So you feel okay. I'm le- I'm eating a little bit lower uh, calorie diet, and but then on day three is when your body is now saying, look, I need to really push the cells to do the renewal. So day three is a little bit that day where you feel it's difficult. On day four and five, the ketones are high. Your body is already kind of in a mode, I'm, I'm, I'm not dependent on food. I want to go on my autopilot, which let me live on my own ketones. I bring down my fat. I want to be independent. And this is where the brain, and for most people in the U.S., this would be the very first time that your body is living on ketones, right? We developed so well the food supply chain. All of us eat every few hours. We never went two, three, four days without food to experience what could be a brain Detox, let me use that word. I mean, it, I don't know if it exists per se, but w- meaning how can we, the brain not living on, on, on carbs and not living on the toxins coming into it from the daily activities we do, but the brain switching to ketone. And, and for people who don't know, the brain is a fat organ and ketones are derivative of fat. So it's, so on day four and five, you feel a lot of people tell you, hey, I'm feeling that independence. I start feeling the energy and I'm not really looking at food in the same appetite. It's something is changing. And going back, once you start eating again, or, or you're already eating with problem, but going back to your normal diet on day 6 to 10, this is where a lot of people talk about that sense of empowerment, that better sleep, better energy, because now their body transformed. It's a lean, mean, ready-to-blossom machine, and then suddenly you bring back the food that you like to it, and you're, you're financing if you want. It's like, again, taking the company through pre-bankruptcy. It's a lean great operationally you know, uh, uh, company, and then you give it back money and it uses it in the right way. So day four and five is when people feel that independence. And then when they start refeeding is they feel like amazing. I'm back on my food. I don't have the same big appetite. I don't have the same big addiction that I had. And I don't need these big plates that I used to depend on. And I don't need to snack at 11 p.m. And I don't need to eat always uh, multiple times a day. So there's that sense of empowerment, behavioral change. And a lot of people talk about changing their relationship with food. I never learned about this word before. And, and it was mainly heard of the problem consumer saying, I really feel I have a different relationship with food in here. And that's true. I, I felt that over the, the many times that I did the diet. You look at food. You One thing I noticed was you you look at food advertising in a different way and perhaps you, yes. you, you notice things and, and yes you might be disgusted by what yes. you see on billboards or on television because uh, it just doesn't appeal to you anymore yes you feel food was a trap that incrementally we went into and and we just survive with the marketing message that we have you know and and remember even us in nutrition and medicine we thought in the 90s and early 2000s that we need to eat six seven times a day do you remember the days when we said eat smaller portion, but eat multiple times a day? It was a, it was a little bit of a disaster from a, we saw the obesity results from that because you don't control your portion. When you put food on the table, you eat, and then eating multiple times a day is telling the body, I'm fueling you multiple times a day. You have a lot more food. You stock it in fat and progress faster into worsening you know, your biological aging and it increases exposure to the age and nutrition-related chronic diseases. So... We, um, you know, we haven't talked about it this today, but I think what Walter has done, his service to humanity and what Alnutra is trying to do in a practical way in the market, he helped us understand how humans in, in, in before, you know, were eating and not eating and what is the food that correlates with a better, healthier, longer living you. And our ancestors, if you think about it, they were not stacking six times a day. They barely had food. And when they slept early because the sun was down, 6, 7 p.m., early dinner, then they stay overnight with no food. And then they have breakfast in the morning, some leftovers from yesterday, and then they go and seek food. So that um, uh, easiness of access of food that we had in the last two decades probably was mainly behind this obesity movement. Obviously, 
with the predisposition of we're stressed, we have so many works to do, we stay late night up uh, working and all of that, that calls for more food and more snacking. And now it's easy to access food. In terms of the, the longevity goal of the diet, and longevity science by its very nature takes a long time. Yes. Yeah. Is it possible to assess how the diet is doing, apart from those short-term benefits that you talk yes. about and the way that people feel in the immediate aftermath to the diet, they've perhaps lost a few pounds, yeah. and they feel mentally invigorated and perhaps they're sleeping yeah. better. But is there any way, is there any data yet that shows that their longevity or the potential for good yeah. longevity in a long health span yeah. has been improved? So if, if you want to do a pure longevity uh, trial, you have to go for you know, 40, 50 year long trial to be able to demonstrate that to 100%. So what, what scientists do is because aging is the main determinant of longevity, they try to find markers of aging or groups of markers, and they try to show whether there's an intervention that can impact that biological aging. And if it does, then the assumption is it will help you live healthier and, and hopefully longer. So there's no promise on any product that you're going to be living long on it unless you do that long, you know, long-term trial. But what all the aging researchers do, they find correlates of aging and they measure those and they see what the intervention does on those. In our case, um, we had worked with a, a, um, a, an expert in measuring biological aging. Her name is Morgan Levine, and she has a couple of big articles on biological aging and how to measure it. And basically, and, and she's at Yale and Yale and USC worked on this. And what they did is they said, um, because the U.S. government, thankfully, did uh, actually at 19, 20 years observational trial longevity, if you want to think about it, on more than 9,000 people. It was 9,300 something. And they, they collected their blood data, their history, what disease they developed. And when some of them died, you know, they recorded all that. So this, the biostatisticians put their hands on this data and they started looking at, okay, I have your chronological age. You're being a participant in a trial. I have your blood markers. And I know what disease you developed or how long you lived. So can I find a correlation so that, uh, and this is what they did. They did big regressions and they figure out a formula to say, if you're today 40, but you're showing these kind of blood metrics, maybe biologically you're 42 or maybe biologically you're 38. So we call it the, um, the aging score. And based on that aging score, we applied it to what prolon or what the fasting mimicking diet does to these numbers. And, um, and we're going to actually uh, um, uh, hopefully soon publish the results of the data. But um, what we internally have shown by using the biological aging score is showing that there's an improvement into the aging process uh, of the body based on the data I mentioned. Would you like to see a time where we go for our annual physical? If we are lucky enough to have a health yes. plan that provides us with an annual physical, which sadly not everyone has. But if we were to go through that examination and be given yes. an aging score at the end of it, yes. would we benefit? Definitely. I um, Years and years ago and being coming from health policy, you know, I, I'm a big driver and, and maybe first, you know, thought leader behind this idea that the unit of measurement of healthcare, every healthcare system should be biological aging. It's, it's clear, you know, what we should measure, definitely blood glucose, definitely HbA1c, but that's one disease. Definitely want to know if you have the APOE gene. But at the end of the day, and we've done this for every other machine, you know, the car is a machine. And the first question you ask when you want to buy a car is when it was produced. And then this is what determines the price of the car and then the mileage. We have to do the same for us. We have to understand how well are we from the inside. Some of us are 60 uh, but from the inside, we could be 50 because we lived a healthy, you know, healthy lifestyle. And therefore, it's a different approach to that person. And I could be 40, but biologically, if I'm 50, I'm actually more prone to developing diabetes sooner than later and cancer, etc. And this is where moving the sick care system to a health care system, that's the shift we want to make. And I hope, um, you know, if we always talk about the million dollar question, there's a billion or a trillion dollar question is how can we develop a credible biological age measurement so that doctors, nutritionists, healthcare practitioners around the world use that as a unit of measurement of your health. How are you? This is the question. We say, hi, how are you? That how are you is mentally for sure, but also let's add to it this biological aging uh, measurement. There are a lot of you know, some companies use telomeres, others use blood markers, others use, you know, different, different 
but maybe we uh, maybe it's the it's, it's the average of all of them. I don't know, but that's the big question: is how can we find a credible way to measure biological aging so that biological aging becomes the unit of measurement for healthcare? And do you see that as one of the big challenges ahead? There has been this explosion in longevity research yes. in recent years, and the awareness of longevity research as yes. well. I think people understand what you're talking about now, whereas maybe five years ago. Longevity research, what's that all about? And yeah. I think there is a certain attention to the subject now. There is because two things. People are fed up, you know, being sick early and just waiting for a pill to keep them sick long. They were fed up with this model. We want a model where, and this is why self-care is also emerging big time. You know, and, and the Internet helped every one of us being sometimes more cutting edge than our doctor. Most patients are actually reading faster and, and, and embracing new discoveries faster than the doctor. So with the age of the Internet, we're more enlightened. We can read information fast. We're all smart. Um, uh, and, and we are not accepting anymore a system where um, I just go out of a – I go to my doctor after I'm sick and I leave that clinic with five pills for something that could have been solved with lifestyle change. So that lifestyle transformation movement – we definitely, with self-care, I think, is going to define what the healthcare system of the future is going to be. Still an exciting industry to be in for you? It's the most exciting industry, I think, you know, uh, because you're, you're on the fastest movement happening in healthcare is really lifestyle change is the fastest movement today. And number two, you're helping people, you're helping humanity change its record. I think, you know, I don't know if, if, if you know, but in the last four years, we lost in the U.S. 0.4 years on our lifespan. So we crossed two trillion dollar expansion. We keep spending more and more and more money, and the result is a negative result. It's worth repeating that because you often hear, "Oh, people are living longer these days." Not at all. It's not the case. Not at all. Actually, we're flattened in the U.S. and we regressed by zero point four years. Not only that, it's not we're living, we're not living longer. The opposite also: the years we're living, the quality of life, we're living sick long. So we're, soon, hopefully, it's not going to be sick short. You know, that's even worse. What I refer uh, to as all the time as health span. The, yes. the number of years that we live with optimum health, yes. even that has been reducing. Yeah, because this is what matters. Because biologically, even today, if you're 50, because of the bad, unhealthy lifestyle we had, you're 55. So you're, you're going to get diabetes five years earlier or cancer or, or whatever first chronic condition you're going to have. So you, you've been stripped of five years of your life. And I think what we're trying to do at El Nutra, we're trying to bring back years of stolen life uh, uh, to humanity and, and actually even maybe empower that a little bit further. But that's the core mission and that's the most exciting mission that I, that, that I would want to be on. So much work still to be done. Joseph Anton, thank you very much for this interview. It's fascinating to talk to you and uh, I'm certainly going to follow the work of you and Volta and uh, the progression of this diet with a tremendous amount of interest. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. And as I mentioned before, if you'd like to hear more about the fasting mimicking diet, the science behind it, you can go to our website, llamapodcast.com. That's Live Long and Master Aging, double L-A-M-A podcast.com. You can search through the index, uh, Volta's episodes are number one and 46. And uh, while you're there, you might stumble across a few other episodes that pique your interest. And if you like them, you can rate and review us at Apple Podcasts. It's always good to hear what you think of what we're doing. Many thanks for listening. Health optimization is what this podcast is all about, and that means taking care of our mitochondria, the energy centres of our cells. Physical strength, avoiding frailty, is key, and that's why the science behind urolithin A and the work of Timeline Nutrition is so interesting. You can find out more and get a discount code at our website and in the show notes for this episode.